Gather round, market participants. Welcome to another Three Things in Credit. I'm Van Hesser, Chief Strategist at KBRA. Each week, we'll bring to your attention three things that we think are relevant to credit markets that you should know about it. So let's get started. This week, our three things are, one, the noise around rising rates has become deafening. We'll tell you what matters to credit. Two, the loan market has proven to be a port in the rising rate storm. And three, the Fed's latest monetary policy report revised up its latest economic forecast, but it wouldn't be the Fed if it didn't have a warning or two. We'll tell you about them. All right, let's dig a bit deeper into this week's three things. Now, it's pretty clear to us that this will be a noisy year. This is what happens when you have the hurly-burly of markets, more global and more extreme than ever, trying to make sense of a litany of powerful forces crashing into one another. You've got the health crisis and the rollout and efficacy of vaccines trying to end the health crisis. You've got fiscal relief and stimulus trying to build a bridge to the other side of that health crisis. And out of those two, you've got varying degrees of economic rebound and varying timelines of that rebound. You've got shifting patterns of behavior and spend by both individuals and businesses. Oh, and you'll have a considerable debt hangover when all is said and done. And amplifying the din are valuations that are stretched, historically so in many cases. But what has really thrown the market into panic is the spike in rates. But if we wade into this water a bit, we discover significant cross currents running through this story. For instance, If you hold risk assets in the face of rising rates, those risk assets theoretically are going to lose value as we discount future cash flows by a higher discount rate. But what if the reason behind the rate rise is a stronger economy and improved cash flows off of those assets? And then factor in some increased likelihood that the Fed could tighten. Obviously, that prospect is quite low at the moment given the Fed's clear guidance, but that probability is higher today than it was two days ago. Higher rates at some point become an economic headwind as the cost of borrowing increases for both individuals and businesses. But given how low rates are, a 50 or 100 basis point jump in rates, say, on home mortgages will give some prospective borrowers pause, and they may even reset their sights on a lower price point home. But that's not likely to deter them from making the home purchase. Same goes for companies. They may kick themselves for not getting the bottom tick, but in the scheme of things, they are not going to forgo an investment in a new plant or do an acquisition simply because rates have bounced from 2% to 2.5%. I guess the point of all this is, the volatility we've seen in the rates and equity markets really hasn't spilled over into credit, and nor do we think it will. I guess we're very much in the Jay Powell camp here. While we're focused on the challenges in the labor market, the economic scarring that has occurred as a result of the pandemic, and the risks still out there related to the virus, we are comforted by what now appears to be massive stimulus on the way, much closer to Joe Biden's $1.9 trillion target than many originally thought. As we said many times, relief slash stimulus of this size is a true difference maker, at least in the short run. And this doesn't include what is sure to be massive infrastructure bill at some point in the not-too-distant future. All right, so back to our original starting point. This is an environment with big moving pieces amidst valuations that are, in most markets, extreme. There are bound to be bouts of volatility as we move through the year. For credit, we will worry that the volatility could be extreme at times, that an air pocket can develop, a period where liquidity can dry up. We saw hints of that this week with a few deals getting postponed. Still, we would expect those periods to be brief as risk markets find their footing. We continue to believe they will and that the wall of money will magically reappear drawn in by the favorable economic growth story firmed up by the ever-present prospect and likelihood of stimulus. All right, on to our second thing, the strong bid for loans. The leveraged loan market has had its own golden era post the global financial crisis, first spurred on by the enduring success of CLOs. A couple of years ago, the asset class fell a bit out of favor due to its short duration and concerns in the market that underwriting had weakened. That's all changed, 
or at least the part about the appeal of short duration. Leveraged loans have caught a bid once again, driven by the strong bid for floating rate assets and the strengthening economic story. The asset class has had seven consecutive weeks of inflows, the latest being nearly $700 million, according to Refinitiv Lipper, and loans seem to be in the right place at the right time. For the first time in decades, rates are rising, and while few are expecting a material rise in rates over the intermediate term, unthinkable amounts of stimulus have created a favorable backdrop to a fixed income product that does not lose value as rates rise. Loans' lack of duration and yieldy credit stories, the asset class has the most attractive yield per unit of volatility, make them just what the doctor ordered to help beleaguered fixed income managers weather this latest storm. Now, plenty of supply to the loan market has come from both banks and the alternative asset managers, the latter becoming an increasingly important pillar of the financial system. This has been easily digested by investors buying into the favorable economic story, one of recovery and strong government intervention and support, and loan prices have fully recovered back to pre-pandemic levels. The improving backdrop and abundant liquidity, obviously interrelated, mitigate the risk outlined in the bank regulators' newly issued Shared National Credit Program, or SNCC as it is commonly referred to. The SNCC report, quote, assesses risk in the largest and most complex credits shared by multiple regulated financial institutions. The scope of the regulator's review, however, is not limited to deals just among banks. It also comments on non-bank participation in the market. Now, keep in mind that banking regulators have pushed much of riskier, highly leveraged lending out of the banking system and into the capital markets and the alternative asset managers. So the report does give a look at the broader loan market, including the higher end of leveraged lending. Overall, SNCC risk is, quote, high and increased over the last year as a result of COVID-19. No surprise there. Criticized loans rose to 12.4% from 6.9% at the previous year end and pre-COVID. As you might expect, risk in leveraged loans, about half of the program's $5.1 trillion in commitments, is, again, quote, high and increasing and account for a disproportionate share of criticized loans. And unregulated non-banks participating in SNCs have a disproportionate share of criticized loans. Now, none of this should come as a surprise to anyone. So is there froth in the leveraged loan space? Well, given where prices are and the motivation to buy inflation-protected assets, it's a fair comment. This market, especially down the lowest parts of the credit spectrum, is a play on liquidity derived from the economic outlook. Always has been and always will be. Weighed carefully. Okay, on to our third thing the Fed's latest monetary policy report. The report was released about a week or so ago to Congress, and in it, the Fed updates its economic forecast and comments on noteworthy economic and financial developments both here and abroad, and outlines its monetary policy framework. Sounds fairly straightforward. Federal Reserve board members and Federal Reserve bank presidents are asked to submit economic forecasts, and the median values are disclosed. And their latest forecast, tabulated in December, is relatively upbeat, featuring improvements in GDP growth and unemployment over their September forecast, and calls for still modest inflation. For 2021, real GDP is projected to be 4.2%, up from 4% in September, and unemployment is expected to drop to 5% from 5.5%. Growth is expected to moderate, as you would expect as we move past the pandemic, but to levels 3.2% in 2022 and 2.4% in 2023 that are firmly above where they were coming into 2020. So all is good, right? Well, it takes some digging, but buried in the report are some stark warnings. Picking up on the theme we just were talking about, the Fed warns about the risks of leverage that have built up in this cycle across many asset classes. This is more than noteworthy in part because Fed Chair Powell has downplayed the risks of the central bank's super accommodative stance, fueling what many see as asset bubbles across the economy. And given that he signs this report, we wonder if there has been a change of heart or simply he has been awakened to the potential vulnerabilities that are now embedded in the economy. The report highlights more than a few areas of concern. For instance, leverage loans where the credit quality has deteriorated. Commercial real estate, 
where sharp declines in values are possible if the pace of distressed transactions picks up, or in the longer term, the pandemic leads to permanent changes in demand. Corporate credit more broadly, where debt has risen from levels that were already elevated before the outbreak of the pandemic, and where insolvency risks at small and medium-sized firms, as well as some large firms, remains considerable. Insurance companies, where leverage has risen to post-2008 highs. Hedge funds, where vulnerabilities remain elevated due to leverage. And money market mutual funds and open-end investment funds, where significant structural vulnerabilities demonstrated in March of 2020 persist and could significantly amplify future shocks. Now, post the GFC, we've come to expect the Fed to adopt more of a glasses-empty view of the world. After all, they are motivated to do just that. So we take all this with a grain of salt, but tie this back to the points we made at the outset. Big moving pieces crashing into one another. Valuations at extreme levels. Supercharged velocity of flows. Uncharted waters. This is going to be a bumpy ride. So there you have it. Three things in credit. One, the noise around rising rates has become deafening, but the credit story, different from the corporate bond story, remains sound. Two, the loan market has proven to be a port in the rising rate storm. And three, the Fed acknowledges excesses and vulnerabilities in the financial system away from banks. Thanks for listening. As always, let us know what you think. And don't forget to visit kbra.com and sign up for our research. It's free. Just register. See you next week.